You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers about hikers for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hi guys, and thanks for coming back to hang out with me once more. This is Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis, and I am Mighty Blue. As many of you probably know, last week I missed an episode of the show for the first time in my nearly six years of doing it. And first, by the way, I want to thank the very many of you who inquired after my health these past two weeks. It's been very humbling and good to know that you are thinking about me or praying for me. What actually happened was that I was driving around a couple of Thursdays ago when I felt a tightening in my chest. I'd bought an Apple Watch the weekend before and checking my heart rate on the watch. I was a touch alarmed that my rate had increased from its normal standing rate of about 68 to 72, 73, but it was now 183 or 184. I didn't really know what to do or what it even meant, but I carried on driving and for the next 40 or so minutes, the rate hovered between that early 183 or so and at about 165. It wasn't any real pain, but the tightness across my chest was there. So I drove home and I thought I'd just sleep it off. I was actually in my community, only about 100 yards from home, when I stopped the car and I called my doctor. At that time, the rate was around 175. The doctor told me to drive immediately to the emergency room, so that's what I did. By the time I got there, I was struggling, and I was almost doubled up, gasping for breath as I entered. They immediately got me into a wheelchair and pushed me to the front to be admitted. Almost straight away, of course... My heart rate started to come down again, and it was soon back to the early 100s, then 90s, 80s, and so on. I stayed in for observation overnight, and I had several tests, most of which seemed fairly inconclusive. Although one cardiologist did send me to sleep, saying that I may have had a mild heart attack, but he just didn't know. In the end, about 30 hours after I was admitted, they let me go home and told me to book an appointment to get a heart monitor fitted. So that's where I am. It can't be too dangerous because they still haven't seen me to fit a monitor, but I'll keep you posted. Once more, I've really appreciated all the kind words and prayers. I have felt very loved indeed. This week on the show, we have somebody who has just completed the 11 National Scenic Trials and the first woman to do so. As soon as I saw a Facebook post, I reached out and she agreed to come on the show. She is Arlette Lahn, and I'm pretty sure you'll be inspired by her can-do attitude. Arlette will be on in a moment. Then we catch up with two of our surviving Mighty Blue Class of 22. Dom Tamaro and Dan Whitesides continue their respective journeys. Both of them are loving it. Finally today, there's a fairly short reading as the fourth chapter of George Stephanus's Then the Hail Came concludes. So, for the first time in two weeks, <laughs> here's our main guest. Come and meet Arlette Lahn or Apple Pie. You may very well have seen today's guests on Facebook quite a lot, <laughs> quite, you know, very recently. This is Arlette Lahn or Apple Pie. Hey, Arlette, thanks for coming on the show. You're welcome. How's it going? Well, technically, it's not going great. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we've, we've had a few technical issues, but so we're now speaking over Skype. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, it should be okay. Um, and I'm particularly grateful that you agreed to come on so soon after the conclusion of your latest epic adventure. So for those of us, uh, those people out there who don't have Facebook or haven't followed what's been going on, tell everybody what you've just done. Um, so I just finished hiking um, the 11 National Scenic Trails in the U.S., and I'm the first woman to do that. How do you feel about that? Do you feel proud? Do you feel um, accomplished? Do you feel, thank God it's over? I mean, how do you feel? <laughs> thank God it's over? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> uh. No, I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited to have completed this goal. And uh, and then there's room and time to pursue other things that aren't necessarily tied to a uh, to a list, so to speak. Right. So, uh, but it's it's been it's been fun. It's been interesting to do some trails that I might not have necessarily picked 
to hike and uh, and just experience those trails. So, so sure. that was neat, and uh, and it's been yeah, it's been it's been an interesting experience. I'm sure it has. I mean, interesting can hardly describe it because I'm looking up the 11 National Scenic Trails and just to give people some idea, obviously most of us know about the Triple Crown of um, the AT, the CDT and the PCT. And of course, there are three of them. The total mileage that I read, <laughs> it's about 24,500 miles. I think you, you've worked it out as something slightly differently. How many miles have you done as a hiker altogether? Um, I think one time I tried to figure it out, and I got to about thirty five thousand. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, and that doesn't count some of the you know the day hikes or sure. just whatever you know trips and hike guiding trips and, and all of that. But that's about what what we could come up with just from like doing trails and uh, complete trails and sections of trails and yep. And when you do these long trails, at the end of it, are you exhausted? Is, is this something that f- physically drains you or is it f- something that physically feeds you? It depends on the hike. Um, I would say that when I was done with the North Country Trail, um, since that one is uh, just about like 4,700 miles and I've been hiking nonstop for quite a while even before that i was right. doing another hike and didn't take too many breaks so my body was very tired and very tight because i'd been carrying a lot of weight because we finished that one in winter time Ooh. so i was carrying a heavy backpack and um yeah my body was definitely feeling it and also on that hike i had been trying to push as many miles as i could so to get it over uh, with so should, that, i should think to get it over uh, with four thousand <laughs> four forty seven hundred miles is a heck of yeah, a long way isn't it it's long um yeah also in the beginning i was pushing because i was trying to beat winter so i was like well if i can do 25 then maybe i'll be done before december Right. And I wasn't able to uh, to beat winter, so then ended up in winter time, and uh, and it's just that's just very tiring um, to I'm keep sure. backpacking for such a long time. So sure. my body was really tired, and then my mind too. Like I've done trails where, um, like uh, when I finished the Continental Divide Trail, I wasn't tired of hiking at all mentally. I was just like, well, my body would like maybe a week off. <laughs> And then I can keep going. And and I think that's going to be the same right now. Like, I was tired of doing the through hiking, but I'm not tired of the hiking necessarily. Like, I'm looking forward to going to the White Mountains, you know, near my house. And, well, not near, two hours away. But, <laughs> you know, to go and, and climb a mountain just for fun and not have to be aware of how many miles do I have to do today to get to the next tent site or how many sure. miles do I have to do to get to the next water, you know, so yeah. a little bit more leisure. Now, you know? you're not originally from the U.S. Tell us where you're from. I'm from Holland originally, uh, the Netherlands, the country. Right. And grew up there, went to college and, and didn't get into really long distance hiking until I was in California and discovered the Sierra Nevada. Right, the right. Pacific we're gonna we're gonna come yeah. back back to that in a second. Um mm-hmm. so do you know, funny enough, I only discovered probably only a couple of years ago that the country isn't Holland. The country is actually Netherlands, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Because it's a, the soccer team always play used to play under the name of Holland for some reason. I don't know why they still they still uh, well it, it, we used to refer to them as Holland. Maybe the the Dutch didn't, but uh, it, it was kind of surprising to me that Holland. But Holland is a region within Netherlands, I believe, isn't it? Yes, yes. Officially, right. Holland is a region in the Netherlands, and it just happens to be the region that I grew up in. So to right. me, it doesn't really matter. Right. Uh, but the official country name is is the Netherlands the or Netherlands. Nederland in yeah. Dutch. And uh, so some people that live in, you know, the northern eastern sections are like, uh, you know, well, Holland isn't quite the name of the country. So. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. It's, easy, it's easier to say. It doesn't have the <laughs> TH sound in it, you know. So it doesn't right. give away my accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, darn right. And when you were in Europe, were you much of a hiker then? Or did, you sort of referred to it a little bit just then. You said you came to the U.S. in, uh, in the end of the, was it 1999, I think you came to the U.S.? Mm-hmm. And, yes. you, and you discovered yeah. the Sierras. But had you been hiking in Europe at all, or did it literally only start when you got to America? No, I had been hiking in Switzerland. Like right. we would go on on vacation and uh, and and 
do day hikes. And then I would be like, well, wouldn't it be cool to just continue on over the pass? You know, like in Switzerland, you usually hike up to a pass, you have a great view, or you go to a lake and then you go back out. Right. And I was like, well, wouldn't it be cool to just go over the pass to the next town? And um, and then that got me into backpacking and wanting to camp out and, and you know, carrying all my gear. And so, so that's where I, I started to get into backpacking and, and, you know, looked into getting the backpacking gear. And we'd had the sturdy boots that everybody in Europe wears, you know, you got to get the mountaineering boots. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that, that's what got me into it. Yeah. So you, you came over here. And so mm-hmm. you discovered the Sierras, which is just awesome anyway. And you started yes. out, I believe, that this journey of the 11 National Scenic Trail started, I believe, in 2003 with the, P- with the yes. PCT. Why, why, was, why was the PCT your start, or was it just the first thing you discovered? It was basically the first one I ever knew about, um, so I randomly picked up a little flyer at one of those visitor centers in in um, in the Sierra, and and I was like, "Wow, there is a trail all the way from Mexico to Canada. That that looks amazing. Like maybe I should do that before I commit myself to having a family." And and you know, uh, so I looked at that, and that sounded very intriguing, and. Um, and then I did the John Muir Trail in 2002 to just see if I would like to be away or be right. hiking right. for more than just a few nights in a row because that's all I had done. I kind of, you know, then tried to get myself into camping by myself for a few nights and and then did the John Muir Trail and then I loved that. So yeah. I was like, oh my goodness, I can't wait to do this specific crest trail. And uh, and just discover the scenery and uh, just be out there and explore and um, and see if I can do it, you know. So there was that aspect as well. So why is – and the John Muir Trial I've tried three times and failed three times, by the way, um, which I love. Um, why is it such a good fit for you as a person? Is there something within you that likes that – not desolation, but more that aloneness and the vast wilderness around you. Is that that what it is? Um, yes. I mean, obviously, it's a it's a combination of a lot of things. But I, I love exploring. I love you know discovering new scenery. I love being out in the open. That's why I like the mountains where you're ridge walking. I mean, that's my favorite thing when you're out. You know, sure, and sure. you have all this these views around you and and there's space to breathe and uh so so that aspect really appeals to me uh and then the part where you're like physically like can i do it that challenge part is is very exciting as well can i do this is this you know the the harder trails the more adventurous trails are the most exciting ones because you learn something about yourself where your limits are and um so there's, those are a few aspects that really appeal to me. What did you learn about your own limits, Ole? Mm, I think the more I've been doing trails is the more that I learn actually that I can dig really deep. So uh, my limits are more like I can't do 35-mile days. Right. So my physical limits is something that I have obviously encountered like okay well that's not my my body is not that type of person where i can do these speed things necessarily sure Sure. um and my limits the other thing with the winter hiking i've also discovered i am not great with keeping my toes and my uh my fingers you know uh (laughs) warm in winter and so physically those are a few things that i've discovered mentally i can dig really deep Right. So I'm not sure if mentally I have hit a wall. It's usually if something is really intimidating and I'm get very like scaredish kind of, I'll just sit down and I'll let myself feel the fear and <laughs> I'll have a good cry sometimes. Yeah. But then you got to keep going. So you let the tension out and you keep going. And uh, yeah, I think so. I've discovered that mentally 
I, I can dig really deep. So there's not really a mental maybe wall for me in that sense. And emotions on long distance trail, certainly for me, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big guy, you know, but yet I cry, I've cried out a baby several times on the trail. Mm-hmm. It, it feels, yeah, it, it feels, helps. it feels almost embarrassing, but it's not really. You feel almost, no. uh, you feel almost empowered by being able to do that in my view. Uh-huh. And, uh-huh. And, cu- and coming from a, a very low land, um, the Netherlands, obviously very low, um, how did your body cope with the altitude through the Sierras? Or was it just a, a breeze for you? Uh, no, I always, I just need to take time. I need to take time and, and go slowly and, and, and take my time to adjust to altitude. Uh, I am definitely not great with it. I am not great with climbing. I don't have great lungs or, you know, a cardiovascular fitness. Those are, are my, my weaknesses, so to speak. But I have very strong legs. Uh, I but, bloody well think so yeah. now. <laughs> if you haven't got strong yeah, legs by now, over 35,000 miles, you're never going to get them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and that's one of the things that for me, that the, that first long distance trail really made me appreciate my body. Like, yes, I might not be as fast as some of the other hikers, but I also am, and my body is strong. Like I don't have these beautiful legs, but they also haven't failed me. Yeah. Well, so that's, you know, that, that's like, important. Bit. You know, focus on, on the strength of your body. Absolutely. Uh, and, and so I've gotten, uh, yeah, I've really gotten to appreciate appreciate that that first long hike what was your main takeaway did it it obviously gave you an ambition to do more um mm-hmm. did you did you feel that it gave you something you thought man i can really do this because whatever you've done in europe you said you did day hikes and up to the top of the mountain then down again doing a long distance hike for six months or four months or five months whatever however long it took you that gives you something extra, doesn't it? What What was your main takeaway from that long distance, first long distance hike? Uh, so for me, it's perfect. Like it's got that little routine that's like nice. You know, you got your routine, you get up, you figure out where the water is, how much food you have, blah, 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 all that stuff. And so it's that, that, that security, like, oh, that's, that's, I know how to do that. And yeah. then you've got the excitement of ev- seeing something new every day. Sure. And, and, and feeling a freedom. You know, even though you're kind of following somebody else's line or route, you still have a sort of a freedom. Like I'm out here doing this yeah. and uh, and and living life and enjoying it, and uh, even if it's miserable, you know. Uh, so so I think that's that's what I've got out of it. That it just that for me was perfect. And and I'd always wanted to travel. And I I always traveled but not necessarily as a, as a long distance hiker. Sure. And, uh, and it kind of got me back to that excitement of like, Oh yeah, I love this. I love traveling. Uh-huh. I love discovering. I need to do more of this. <laughs> Clearly. Uh, <laughs> so yes. you went from the PCT and you went on, which I suppose would be a traditional sort of route to go and do the triple crown, the CDT and the AT. When did you do those? So I did the CDT in 04 uh-huh. and the AT in 05. Right. So in the space of three years, you've stepped away from life. I'm going to talk about that in a minute as well. Um, but when did the plan to hike all 11 trails form in your mind? Was there something, you know, because most people say triple crown, I'm done, I'm good to go. But you specifically went for the 11 um Natural scenic, natural scenic trails. So when did that plan start forming itself? Um, so I I kept hiking. I might you know I did I did take a little bit of a break from the long distance hikes for a little bit you know just to uh, get back to working and stuff like that. Uh, but I had been doing other trails that weren't national scenic trails and randomly some of the national scenic trails and uh, and then I was talking to Nimble Will Nomad when we were doing the Pinhoti Trail in Alabama, right. and he is one of the guys who has done them all. And he's like, "Wow, well, you could you could be the first woman to do them all, <laughs> and and you only have four left." And I'm like, "Yeah, <laughs> only four, but one of them is the North Country Trail, which is ridiculously long, yeah. and and wasn't really on top of my list to hike." Um, and, uh, and, you know, you start thinking about it. And then my, my friend Buck 30 was pursuing, you know, to finish the list because he had done the same thing. He'd just done randomly done a whole bunch of hikes and some of them were national scenic trails. Right. And he was also like, well, I guess I only have a few left. Might as well. 
<laughs> and um, so, uh, so I was following him, and uh, um, yeah. So then I decided to kind of plan to do the rest of them, and uh, that's how that went. So in 2018 is when I started to focus on on the the rest of them. Oh right, so it was quite a gap then between the between the longer trails and when you got back into it, and you just finished this year. Um, how did you, you mention? And you kind of alluded to work just now. How were you able to get away from? from work and life, in fact, you know, relationships for, for that period of time? Uh, for the last couple of years, I mean, I live very cheaply and uh, so does my husband. So we, we don't spend too much money right. uh, and we'd both been working and he had a steady job, at his own uh, tree company that he just sold. Uh, but um, so there was that money and then I'd been working on my own business making dolls. So I've been selling dolls online and at craft fairs and I um, guide in the White Mountains. Nice. So, uh, wow. Yeah. Gu- guiding yeah. So guiding in the White Mountains. Guiding in the White uh-huh. Mountains. Oh, I, yeah. we, you didn't mention yeah. this the other day. So t- tell me, what, that, okay, what, yeah. what, what, what does that entail then? Um, so when people are who are unfamiliar with the White want to do like say a presidential traverse and uh they want to have the security of somebody else that knows all the um other trails like if you need to bail out or they don't feel secure enough because it's you know boulders or if they're a little older and they they just want to have that person there to make sure they're safe or uh or they want to explore a wilderness area and there's a bunch of wilderness trails that are kind of crappy trails because uh, they're not well maintained or not well marked but it's like a wilderness experience almost like so so there's people that want to explore those and they're like well but i would rather have somebody that knows the area and so if if something happens they know where to go or they can help me out um so uh and then there's some older women that have never backpacked before but they are working on the 48 4000 right, footer list right and a few of those peaks require a really long day hike or you have to do it as an overnight so they want to finish that list but they've never backpacked before so then they come to us and um and I can say like well this is what the gear you need they can rent it or they can buy some or uh, borrow some, and then I'll take them out on their first ever backpacking overnight, and they get their peaks. And um, so we help people reach their goals, so to speak. Well, it'd be very, very rewarding. Co- very cool to be guided by a record holder like you, I must say. <laughs> so, <laughs> so once you had this in your mind to to do this, this eleven scenic trails, and Nimblewool is guilty of uh, getting you to do that. Yes. Um, Yes. Once you had that goal, <laughs> did it change how you approached and even how you actually enjoyed hiking? Um, a little bit because I was doing uh, – then I was doing trails that I might not have necessarily hiked. Right. So uh, there's the Potomac Heritage Trail, which in itself is, is an interesting trail, but it's better done as a bike trip. Right. Uh, if your first, the first section has a bunch of road walking – and then you're on the CNO Canal Pass, which right. you could bike. Yeah. And then you're on the uh, Allegheny Rail Trail, which you could bike. And and then you have like 70 plus miles in, in Pennsylvania on a trail. So uh, that I would have normally, if I wanted to do that, I would have just biked it. I wouldn't have walked it. So so you're doing that kind of stuff. But because it was part of the National Scenic Trails, that was one you had to yeah. t- check off the list. Kind of, yeah. You know what? Yeah. I'm, and you you mentioned the expression enjoyment and expectations yesterday. So you had to sort of manage your expectations of all those hikes. But did yeah. you still get something out of each hike though that you can look back on and think, well, that was worth it. That part of it was worth doing. Oh yeah, there is always something. And and if it's something that even if it's not like a let's say positive wilderness experience, you know, uh, for me as not as an American, like I've learned what the culture is in an area so it's just then it's a different experience like okay so rural ohio what is that like i've never been you know so Uh you walk through there or oh florida oh florida has a lot more rednecky than i i knew i didn't really know anything about florida you know careful careful i come from florida (laughs) 
<laughs> so you don't you don't know these things, and 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 so it's a different type of experience. I don't maybe always get that like soul feeding like high that I might get from a mountaintop. But I do learn, uh, do learn things or meet people or, or on the North Country Trail, like, oh, you should taste a pasty. I'm like, okay, what is a pasty? <laughs> okay, so it's this pastry filled, you know, lunch sandwichy kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, so you, you're learning all these things. And I had never heard about the um, Superior Hiking Trail, which is part of the North Country Trail. Yeah. And I might have never learned about it. And that was a gorgeous trail. So, uh, yeah, so you're always getting something out of it. It's funny, the, the cultural, you immerse yourself in a local culture partly, don't you? You mm-hmm. know, you, you, you do learn stuff on the way. So I'm glad you got that much out of it as, as well. And did you tend to stick with the same gear throughout or did you make changes as you needed along the way? I mean, apart from hiking in winter and hiking in, in summer, is, is there things you change for certain reasons or do things just wear out? Or did you basically go with pretty much the same stuff? Um, and there's, yeah, I did change out things depending on, on needs, obviously. And, and if things wear out, um, the, one of the weirder things was this last hike. I basically carried two pairs of sandals because when I was hiking in Minnesota last year, I got plantar fasciitis and, uh, my normal go-to shoe doesn't really have good arch support at all. So, uh, I needed to find something that had arch support. So, uh, uh, so I had to change out the shoes, which is kind of a weird thing yeah. to change out. Um, yeah, yeah. And and I, I picked a different dress <laughs> <laughs> for the North Contra Trail and the Ice Age Trail because I knew there was going to be a lot of road walking. So I wanted to be visible. And I knew that I would probably hit hunting season. So I wanted to be visible. So I had a, the orange dress was, was why, you know, I had that. And also rep- and, it uh, represents yeah. Holland as well, doesn't it? Orange is, it is Holland. That's yes, right. Yeah. It definitely does. Yeah. So, uh, and when we spoke yesterday, you told me that it, it is the wilderness and the mountains that inspire you. But as you've just sort of, sort of referred to back then with all these trails or most of them anyway, there's quite a bit of road walking, isn't there? How did you handle what must have been, I don't know, about a thousand miles of road walking? I don't know, maybe it's not as much oh. as that, but I bet it was a heck of a lot, oh, wasn't it? It's, it's more than that. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, the, the Ice Age Trail is half uh, road walking, so you got about like 500 miles of road walking in there. Wow. Uh, and then there's different types of road walking. I mean, like on the CDT, you might have a road walk, but it might just be like a dirt du- two track, which sure. is still wild and cool, you know. Yeah. Uh, a Florida trail, you might have a bike path, you know, in in a not so, in a more urban area, and uh, so that's a um, it's something to get used to in a way, you know, or, and it requires different planning for camping too, because if you're in the woods, you can just be like, okay, well, you know, I'm going to go try to find a flat spot, but you got to, so you got to plan more of where you think you're going to camp. And uh, that takes some, some skill as well. And in all your time out there, you normally go alone, don't you? You don't always go alone, do you? No, I do a little bit of both. And I like, I like both. Right. So wait, but when you're by yourself, uh, have you ever felt threatened or you ever felt at risk yourself or are you so comfortable out there that you're, this is your environment? Most of the time I feel totally fine. Uh, The times that I've been scared, it was because of dogs. Oh God. And that was mostly Ohio. So I got one of those dog, they're called dog gazers. It's like, it emits like this little high pitched noise. And if you, you know, press the button, then they get out of their aggressive thing. Oh. But I was never scared of dogs. And now I'm basically traumatized because <laughs> you would have a pack of dogs just, you know, running at you. Oh my gosh. And it's terrifying. That's more terrifying than seeing a bear in the wild because <laughs> a bear in the wild is usually skittish and as soon as it sees you it will run off but these dogs they're not afraid of you so it's a very different experience yeah. now, not a good one <laughs> having done having done all these miles and, and all these trips tell us one of the one or maybe two uh, of your high points you know you, there must be moments you, you you lie down in bed at night you think close your eyes and you think back to a particular moment on the trail can you think of a couple of those that you're just going to take with you forever 
Yeah, I mean, like when you're when you're at a in a mountaintop and there's like a sunset. I remember on the PCT, then you know, up in Washington, I think we were going towards Red Pass, and and it's fall colors already, so everything is kind of reddish. Nice. And then there was this this beautiful sunset as we're walking up. So that was just gorgeous. And uh, I don't know something else that jumps. Usually, it's sunsets and sunrises that are just like, "Oh my god, I can't believe it. it's so yeah. beautiful." Yeah, uh, I've yeah yeah I've had an experience that wasn't during the long distance hike, but that up in the White Mountains during early winter. So it wasn't a ton of snow, but it was fresh snow. And I'm up there, and we have an, an undercast, so we're above the clouds. But I'm in these peaks, and it felt like I was on top of Everest. So oh, like wow. all these peaks. We're peeking out of the clouds and everything is white and covered in snow. And it was just gorgeous. It was amazing. So some of those moments. And you've already referred to crying on the trail, but that doesn't necessarily Mm -hmm. suggest a low point. So you talked about your high points. So have you had some real low points that didn't actually entail crying? Just thinking, oh, I'm just done with this. Oh, yeah. I think the worst probably last year uh, was when I was in Minnesota at the end of the in the border route section, which is very remote. And I was just tired and my body was hurting. I had allergies, so I felt really sluggish and I just woke up like crying because I was just done. And uh, luckily... A friend of mine was meeting me a few days after, and I knew that she was coming to meet me to hike, you know, the Superior Hiking Trail with me. So that was, I don't know, I, it would have been, I, I, I wouldn't have quit, but it was close. <laughs> uh, how do you shake I yourself, how do you shake yourself out of that? You just, you, you just go around the corner and see another fantastic view and think, ah, oh, this is why I'm doing it. Uh, yes, or you just, you know, you just refocus and you just, keep going and you think like well it's gonna get better at some point i'll get over this i'll be better maybe i just need to take a day off or two days off and um and get a good sleep and uh rest is very important and because i've tried to push that was last year as well or in some other hikes too where you just try to push because you're like well i don't need that zero day i just need to make miles and for me that catches up to me if i don't take rest I just get too tired and then I'm emotionally, you know, worn out. Yeah. It's one of the things I've said to people before. You just can't take on the trail. You've got to let let it all come to you and do what you can do when you can do it. Because if you start trying to take mm-hmm. it on, it'll kick your ass, won't it? Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. Yeah. So – you've done those 11 and I'm sure you've done other trails. You said you've done loads of other trails as well. Mm-hmm. Which is your favourite trail? And, and I guess, in other words, if, if you could have done just one – which one would that be? It would still be the Continental Divide Trail. Would it? Why is that? Uh, because that was uh, the biggest adventure for me at the time. And you are in the mountains a lot. And you are you see herds of elk. And, uh, yeah, so at that time, that was that was a big adventure. And, and the scenery is great. And the... There's a difference in trail tread. Sometimes it was good. Sometimes, you know, not so much. But I think that one, yeah, that one was probably still my biggest one. I mean, like, and then, like, the other, the Hayduk I would not do again. But that was, like, one of that I was the most proud of because it was so challenging and out of really? my comfort zone. Really? In what way yeah. then, aren't it? Uh, the Hayduk Trail, because it had some scrambling in it uh, that I wasn't super skilled at. <laughs> <laughs> so so i would i would be at some point i ended up in this canyon and i had to climb over these boulders and and do some of these these canyoneering techniques that i only had read about in books or seen on a photograph i'm like oh well i guess i have to do this stemming <laughs> thing while i'm like in between a rock and the wall and i just <laughs> kind of spider walk up and like I seen it in a photo once, I guess it works, and then it works. And you're like, oh my god, that works! Um, so it was probably one of the hardest things I've ever done, and I like, probably cried like three or four times in there. But you know, you're like, all right, well, I, I guess I don't want to walk back or climb back, so I have to keep going. Um, so that one is probably one of the ones that I got the most out of it that I was proud of that I was able to do it. 
I wouldn't do that one again, though. But the CDT, I would. The, oh, there's a lot that I would do again in a mm. different season. Have you know, have more experience, uh, different direction. You know, something you just said that really resonates with me. You said, "Well, I don't want to go back. I can't go back." And it's that, that thing mm. that when you're on a trail, if you, you can fall over, sit down, and cry, whatever you want to do, but you have no option other than to go forward. Do you? Unless you're just mm-hmm. out of the park, yeah. parking lot. So this thing, like, what it. It, this is such a great metaphor for life, I think, hiking. It makes you do something, makes you continue on, doesn't it? It makes you keep wanting to go on and keep pushing on. And it, because you can't, yeah. you literally cannot go back. And and I know this is probably unfair because I think you only finished the Ice Hour Trail. We're recording now on Friday the 15th. When did you actually finish the Ice Hour Trail? Ice Age Trail? Uh, the 11th. Oh, right. On only, the 11th. A few, only a few days ago. Yeah. So you may not have actually totally process this now that you have done what have you taken away from the whole thing what is the thing that you you think you've taken away from not just in individual hikes but the whole thing that you've achieved um i think for me personally is that i have learned that i can dig pretty deep and and keep pushing when it comes to having a goal right and that's important, and you know, and you sort of sort of referred to that earlier on. So I want to expand upon that a little bit then, because because looking at some of your pictures, you look like a normal person, not an athlete or a woman who's hiked over thirty thousand miles. What do you want to say to people who think they can't do something like this because of their age, their shape, their whatever it is they they've got standing in their way? How 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 does your example encourage people to do do more? So, yeah, I hope to show that you don't have to be that, you know, super athletic or, or be, you know, in your early 20s that you you can go out and enjoy nature and go for hikes with, within reason, you know, what your, your physical capabilities are. Um, and don't don't let yourself be limited by what you think you can do or by what you see other people out there. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm 50 years old. I'm definitely have some extra weight on me, but, um, I, I can do these things and, uh, and you don't have to do like a 2000 mile trail, you know, you can go for an overnight, go for a short day hike, just get out there and, and don't be intimidated by, by, by the people around you or by the hikers around you. So what if they can go faster? It yes. doesn't matter. You're still out there, you know, you're still out there and you're still enjoying the outside. You go a mile up, you go a mile down, you have enjoyed your time out there. And, and it's just as valuable as it is if somebody does 40 miles in a day, which I've never done. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've got um, no desire to do that either, frankly. Yeah. You know, I, I've just come yeah. back from Scotland. I hiked in the West Highland Way in Scotland with my buddy, oh, John. Nice. My buddy, John. It's only 90-odd miles, and I was originally planning to do it in six days, but we did it in nine days because mm-hmm. he'd never hiked and he just wanted to go – he wanted to saunter, like John Muir said. And do you know what? Yes. And, and I realised, you know, not once, literally not once on that hike did we pass – a single human being they all passed us who gives a crap mm-hmm. i didn't care yeah. you know we were having a yeah. good time we talked constantly we sat down for a cup of tea when we wanted a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and we just enjoyed each other's company being out on the trail so that you know i'm i i've well said what you just said people get make up not make up but they find excuses for not doing something when really there's literally nothing in your way if you can walk 150, 200 yards without requiring oxygen, you can go on a hike as far as I'm concerned. So I appreciate yeah, I mean, you sharing okay. that. Yeah. Yeah. I took my mom. My mom loves to go out, and uh, but she's now 85. The last time she was out here in the white, so we went a mile and a half to a shelter and camped there. I mean, I carried her gear. She had a day pack. Wow. We camped out for the night, and then the next day we went a mile and a half back down, and we had a wonderful trip. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So you don't always have to go far to get a good experience out of it. And do you still have any hiking ambitions to do anything, say, hiking more extensively abroad, or are there other places in America you want to do? Yeah, both. I mean, uh, 
I, it, maybe it is time to do that Camino to Santiago, finally, that everybody's <laughs> like, hey, have you done the Camino yet? I'm like, no, I haven't. Uh, you know, but just, just have it, like what you're saying, like as a, as a saunter, like just, just enjoy the scenery and just enjoy the culture and do it with like two friends who are into the same thing about, you know, that's about the expectations. It's not going to be a wilderness trail. It's yeah. going to be a cultural experience. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and there's definitely also lots of beautiful trails in, in Europe that I haven't really discovered right, yet. Right. And, uh, and there's shorter hikes, like the Wachita trail that I haven't hiked yet. That sounds pretty fun. And, uh, and rehiking, like I said, rehiking some of the other trails, but in different directions and different seasons. And, um, yeah, well, that, that all makes it, keeps it interesting. So you, plenty, you, you've learned plenty of things to do. You've learned so much from hiking, you know, and, and I really appreciate you coming on the show to share that experience because, you know, giving that example of of how anybody can get up and do this is probably the most important takeaway, I think, when people listen to this. And so I appreciate you coming on the show and so many, many congratulations for what you've done. I really, I really think you've done a remarkable thing. And um, thank you. as I say, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Cheers then. Bye. Yep. Bye. You know, having somebody like Arlette on the show is one of the reasons that doing this show is so much fun for me. She isn't a super athlete. She's an ordinary person who has done an extraordinary thing. She doesn't even pretend to be a farsighter. She just gets it done at her pace with the mileage she wants to do. You can listen to so many so-called experts on YouTube and elsewhere, but hearing Arlette saying, I don't have great lungs or cardiovascular fitness, she's a person who hikes within her own limitations, knows what she can do, and does it. I hope that there's someone out there who has just decided, after listening to Arlette, that she, or he, is going to do a long-distance trial next year. And having spoken with Arlette, I'm absolutely sure that she'd love to know that she's influenced that person. And by the way, check out our show notes and look at the picture she was talking about when she was in New Hampshire, in snow, above the clouds. You will just stare at it and shake your head. It is awesome. Now, let's catch up with Dom and Dan. First up is Dom. So we're back on with Dom. Hey, Dom, how are you? Hey, Steve. How are you? I'm good. I'm suffering... um, I'm, you know, I'm back podcasting again, having had a week off, and I feel like I have never been away because I'm still getting trouble after trouble. Us getting online together just now is a good example of it. <laughs> um, and a couple of things we want to talk about this week. You know, you you're you flip north, and you're back home right now, aren't you? Correct. You're back home right now, right? But you flip north, and you say you're having kind of mixed feelings about leaving your friends. Talk to us about that. Yeah, you know, I didn't, I didn't really anticipate that, but um, I would say over the last month or so, uh, I've been hiking off and on with uh, um, a same group of people, um, more consistently with uh, with some, especially this uh, one couple, cough drop and and dragonfly, and uh, mm-hmm. and we have a really good rapport, we have a good uh, relationship, and it it bumps me out a bit to to leave them behind um this past week we passed the uh 1100 mile mark we passed the the actual halfway mark and we completed the ice cream challenge and all of that was with with, i mean the half gallon challenge and and all of that was with kind of a, a core group of people that i'm sorry to 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 move away from um, so, I, so no, hang on. So they're going north still, and you, you've gone up there. Are they thinking they're going to get there with with, with eleven hundred miles to go? Are they going to get there in time? Do you think? Yeah, and I think that that you know the the difference that I see in in our hiking abilities is that you know I'm rushing through the day. I'm I'm trying to be at the top of my speed and capacity, and um, and feeling like I'm just barely keeping up that's not a comfortable feeling to have though is no, it or, or no. if you, are you are okay well you know what there's good and bad about leaving them then isn't there really yeah because and so you, that, know, you you can hike your own hike again now right and that's exactly my um my rationale I'm, I'm convinced that moving north and completing 
uh, the New England states in a in a a more relaxed pace is exactly the right thing for me to do. But what I didn't realize is that it comes at a bit of a social and 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 friendship kind of cost. Sure. Sure. Yeah, we'll no question. In, no question about it. No we'll, question about we'll it. We'll certainly and, keep in touch. And and the way I'm doing it, I'm hoping that uh, eventually we'll we'll sink again. You know, in New Hampshire and Maine. You'll you'll bump into them, won't you? They're coming. Yeah, yeah. They're coming north. You're you're heading south. That's yeah. right. So so what's the plan right now? Then you're you're at home now. How, how long are you home for now? Um, my goal is to be home no more than uh, a week. It it ideally. You know, it's today is Tuesday. Ideally, I'm back on trail by Friday, by Friday or Saturday, but tomorrow I have an appointment with my orthopedist. My my knee has still been giving me trouble, um, right. and it responds to rest and ibuprofen and right and and ice. So, I'm going to agree to rest it based on on his recommendation. Uh, give him up to a week. After a week, I'm back on trail one way or the other. Right, right. That's, that's a good, good determined attitude. So, are you actually going to start at Catard then? No, I'm. I'm going to do it the other way around. I'm going to continue northbound. I'm going to start at Vermont, uh, oh, the that's Massachusetts right. that's Vermont right. border, and I'm going to. Yeah. I just think of New England in a northbound orientation, and yeah, uh, I think that. So, I'm going to. I'm going to move northbound. This way, if I do synchronize with my friends, um, we'll be able to actually do some hiking together. Sure, that'd be re- that'd be real nice as well, and there'll be there'll be people who have passed you, and you'll probably catch up with them now anyway, won't you? Right. Which is kind of cool. And then, yeah, and then once cool. I'm once I get to Katahdin, then I'll and and for me, having that Katahdin moment as the culmination of my cumulative northbound hike, that's going to be very meaningful. But doing it this way, you know, my goal is that I'm going to end my complete hike of the AT. Um, I'm going to save Massachusetts for last. Right. And that means that um, I'll be able to do a few days of hiking with my kids, should they wish to join me. And my wife, Kay, is going to be able to meet me when I complete the, the whole thing. And so that. So where will you actually finish it then? Where will you actually. I, where, where, will your, where, your, where, your, where will your Katahdin be? Uh, my Katahdin will be kind of the Williamstown, North Adams kind of area. I haven't quite picked it out, but it'll be at the Massachusetts Vermont border. Right. Okay, cool. Very cool. Now, you mentioned just now the half gallon challenge, which is a favorite of everybody, of course. And you do not look like a man who could possibly have been eating a half a gallon of ice cream. How much do you say you've lost now? Wait, you told I've, me earlier. So I've lost about 40 pounds, 42 pounds. Wow. Wow. You know, I told the group that I was with, I was the oldest person in the group of about a dozen people participating in the half gallon challenge. I said, you know, you guys are all doing shakedown hikes. You know, my shakedowns was preparing for the half gallon challenge. <laughs> so uh, that was it. Was actually that was a lot of fun. How how, how long did it take you to do it? Uh, just just at thirty minutes. I was twenty seven. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I didn't. Do it. I did. I don't think I did it. I'm not sure. I did it second time. First time it was definitely twenty seven. One got one of the young guys with us. It he was fifty four and he was violently ill. I was actually violently ill myself later that night. It was just too much because I had pasta on top. I, I had pasta that night on top of the gallon, half gallon of ice cream. It just, it was not a winning combination, let me tell you. <laughs> so tell me about the roller coaster because I know you've done that as well, haven't you, since we last spoke? Oh, the roller coaster was, I would say, the low point of the trail for me. Um, really? It was it it's tough, was, isn't it? It's tough. It's tough. And it's, it's a lot of ascent and descent packed into a very short, you know, you look at it, you say, well, 13 and a half miles, how bad can that be? Well, with the ups and downs, it's really bad. And it's not, it's in an area that is, I think, quite monotonous. Um, there's not it a lot is. of ease. The, yeah. And the roller coaster itself is monotonous for that reason as well. There aren't many, aren't many views there as well. Right. There's something, you know, you have to get over, isn't it? And it, and it's it, there's still this kind of st- not charm, but certainly this one good feeling once you get over the last one. Yeah. Because <laughs> you know you're done. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And the, the thing is that, so I I didn't do it in a full day. I, I split it up. I stayed at a shelter in the middle of the of the roller coaster, about a, maybe about a third in. And so I, I did it a third and then two thirds. And the two thirds on the second day, it was raining all day. 
And, and so doing the roller coaster, the only thing worse than doing the roller coaster is doing the roller coaster in the rain. And That's I was true. miserable. And, and throughout the whole roller coaster, I kept thinking, you don't quit on a bad day. And this is a bad day. And then when I was yeah. done, I was confronted with this feeling of accomplishment that made yeah. it seem okay. Yeah. Which I didn't, good. I didn't you really anticipate. Do. Um, but it still was the absolute low point of, of the hike. I'm glad that I wow, accomplished that's interesting. it. Um, but for me, it was, it was, it was definitely the, the worst part. I was so happy. Yeah, to be so done with it, it. it can be absolutely brutal. It really can be. Yeah. But then, then when you're done with it, you get to go to Harper's Ferry, yeah. which I thought yeah. was extraordinary. It was a very moving place to be both because of its, the, the, the meaning that it has with the AT as well as its its uh its role in American history, it was it was great. Sure, sure. Send me your picture. Have you got your halfway picture? Oh, I will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Send me that. That'd be cool. Yeah. Um, and one thing you wrote in the text that you sent me, you said you wanted to talk about the, re the reaction of day hikers to through hiker answers to their questions. Is that like like how much weight have you lost or how much you're carrying? What what, what are they asking you? Yeah, they, they um, you know, it's funny that um in in his book. Bill Bryson writes about being at Big Meadows and having the day hikers at the waysides in Shenandoah marvel at the fact that they were walking uh, the Appalachian sure. Trail. And I got yeah. that feeling as we had more and more day hikers. You know, as you get farther north, you get Shenandoah, you get a lot of folks doing day hikes. And they, you know, how much is your pack way? Uh, where do you get water? How much food do you carry? What do you eat? And all of those things, which by now to most through hikers or even lashers has become a routine, seem so extraordinary to day hikers. It puts it in perspective. It makes me think this really is a a, a cool thing to do. And, and no question. And by the way, yes, no, uh I didn't think fully that I'd be able to be successful at this. But here it is now. 1100 or 1000 miles and it's going well and it takes the perspective of the day hikers i think to underscore that for me i, I was really happy whenever a day hiker asked me a question about uh -huh. my hike i was all there i was like, yeah bring it on uh -huh. i would love to answer those questions well i'm now wondering actually with you losing 42 pounds already i mean are you fit are you looking good you say you look you look good in your face you lost quite a lot in your face you looking is your body slimmed down as well quite a bit yeah i feel great i got the there's that distinction between how my body looks above the waist and below the waist, right? Below <laughs> the, the waist. The T-Rex The T-Rex That's exactly yeah. right. Um, <laughs> although I have to say right now at this moment, my body's not looking all that great because I stayed at a shelter. And I think um, there was, uh, um, what are they called? Um, chiggers, small bugs, but I'm, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm covered in, in welts and bugs and itchy all over. So, oh my gosh! Part of what I'm going to do is, uh, while I'm home, is have a, a, a meaningful relationship with some topical steroids. <laughs> nice. Well, look, you're doing well. Um, hope you hope your knee gets itself sorted out, and we'll catch up again in a couple of weeks' time. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, Dom. Take it easy. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Cheers. I love his determination. He's giving the doctor a week at home to sort out his knee, but then he's going back to the trail, whatever state he's in. He's certainly having a blast. Now, whether he's having <laughs> as much of a blast as Trump is, well, you decide. Here's Dan Whitesides or Trumpet. Hello. Hello. How are you? Hey, I'm great. How are you doing? Well, I'm not too bad. Um, I'm, I'm improving, which is good. Uh, I've ever mm -hmm. since I had this problem with my heart, it's um, uh, it's more worrying that what might happen. But uh, I feel okay myself, so we, we'll, we'll go with that, shall we? <laughs> um, Happy to hear it. Good, good. Now um, you're moving on up there, aren't you? Now you're you're getting through stuff, and uh, you've done. I'm trying to think where where were you last time we spoke? Do you remember? Last time we spoke, I think I was in Monson, Maine, right after the 100-mile wilderness. 
Yeah, did we talk about the um, 100 Mile Wilderness? Because you sent me a note saying it was a lot of fun and you were swimming in all the lakes as well in Maine. So how cold was that or was it pretty warm? Oh, it was amazing. I mean, it was really cold, but like after a whole day of hiking, I pretty much planned every campsite around where I could swim in a lake. And oh, there were all these canoes and Frankie and I would canoe out into the lake and eat dinner together on the water. It was so fun. (laughs) <laughs> by the way is it still meals not miles Meal? oh yeah i got the frying pan i've been doing bag salad on trail i've been doing a lot of stir fry i've been i made pancakes in the smart mountain fire tower with my buddy early bird the other day you All said about the food. You, you said you did your first trail magic so you were feeding other people with pancakes yeah so when i, I hit grafton notch and I, unlike in the South, I have a lot of friends up in the North. So my buddy from Portland, Maine, drove up to meet me. I sent him a giant list of food to bring me, including a full pizza and three things of pancake mix. So yeah, I just sat there. I did like a six mile day, set up camp at the parking lot and uh, made pancakes for hikers, gave some pizza, gave, made eggs and omelets for this one guy. Yeah, it was, it was so much fun. So have you have you expanded your kitchen now? Then what else have you got, <laughs> or are you just literally using just the frying pan still? Frying pan. I have my Vargo bot pot, uh, my spork, and a spatula. But uh, I'd love to. Oh, I'll do this. I did this on top of Sugarloaf Mountain, which is probably my favorite campsite so far, besides the fire tower. Huh. I get like two bag salads, mix them together in the bag, throw some cheese in. Throw some olive oil, maybe some seasoning, get a loaf of garlic bread to go with it. It's amazing. <laughs> Have you actually, you might be one of these people who actually puts on weight, or are you, are you losing weight like everybody else is? Oh, uh, I mean, I've, I'm like, I started at 150 and I'm about 137 right now. Oh, but wow. Like, wow, you can't afford to yeah, lose anything, yeah. can you? <laughs> yeah, I never really started out with much to lose, but like, I'm super happy with Frankie's weight. I mean, I met one guy. He had to send his dog home after 750 miles because uh, they couldn't keep weight on him. But, like, I'm, uh, I'm most of the way through this uh, audio book on dog health and nutrition. Uh-huh. So anytime we get to town, it doesn't matter if I get, like, the lowest quality crackers. Frankie is getting the highest quality roast beef I can find. <laughs> How are you handling the finances of this, if you don't mind me asking? Or oh, did you put a, did you save enough money so that you didn't have to worry about it too much? I saved a bunch of money. Um, I worked a job that I really did not enjoy for the last six months prior to the trail. And just saved all that money. And, like, I think what I've learned from, you know, interacting with normal people is that I don't really spend money on anything. I don't really go out and do things with people. Everything I do is, is usually pretty free and outside. So, yeah, just trying to be as cost effective as possible. Yeah, free's um, good. Free's good. You, you learn that the yeah, older, the older you get, the less money you get, you'll realize that free is really good. <laughs> <laughs> I've been enjoying a lot. Yeah, like I'm in, uh, I'm at my friend's house in Vermont, actually. I'm taking a double zero here. He came and hiked with me for two days, and now hanging out here for free. We went to the Vermont discount store, which is a ridiculously cheap place. <laughs> I'm going to make three trays of brownies tomorrow and leave them at the trailhead tomorrow. It's some trail magic. Very cool. Um, Very cool. And you yeah, said I mean, it was a dollar. Why not? You said, you said in your notes that uh, Vermont is beautiful and has delicious raspberries. Uh, so talk to talk about that. Cause not everybody loves Vermont. You know, it's called Vermont. Has it been quite muddy for you or not? <laughs> No, it's been insanely hot and humid. Um, mm-hmm. Like when my friend joined me, so it was Monday was like the first day we got rain for a while. I loved it. I love hiking in the rain. It is so enjoyable. I have a whole playlist of rainy day music. It's all about rain. Like I got Africa from Toto in there and down came the rain. And uh, <laughs> it, it's been so nice. I mean, I'm kind of like past the point of caring whether I'm dirty or muddy or whatever, but Oh my God. Yeah. There's these giant raspberry bushes outside my friend's house and I just cannot stop eating them. I'll probably have some right now, actually. Nice. Oh, they're so good. Yeah. Nice. And you said here that Frankie is a champion rock climber. Has he had to employ those skills quite a bit? Because you've been through the, um, the Mahusik notch, haven't you? And that's tough, isn't it? That was the most challenging thing I have ever done in my life. Oh, wow. Not even physically speaking, but just like, 
they, uh, I'm super pro dogs on trails. I'm sure you can imagine, but they should not allow dogs at the Mahusik Notch. Really? That ba- you find it found it that bad? Did did he did he find it really bad? I mean, he, he went along with it. He was an absolute pro. But like, when you have a sheer ten foot drop, you can't just hang off your your fingers and drop down when you're a dog. You know, I have to get him to really trust me yeah. to jump straight down, put wow. him up, and then I would shoulder press him all seventy pounds above my head onto like a 90 degree rock face, climb up the other side and help him scramble up it. I mean, he was wow. literally like Spider-Man clawing straight up these rock faces. Like, I'm sure if you have a 40 pound dog, this isn't much of an issue, but yeah. Frankie is not a 40 pound dog. Um, and it was just an hour and a half of lifting. I've wondered about that before, about bigger dogs as well and how they get through these places after it, <laughs> it did you regret going through it do you wish you could could have left him somewhere else i mean the, the thing is i wouldn't have left him somewhere else i just wouldn't have done it you know i'm not as i tell people like i'm not going to get the at hiker tattoo after this uh, that is really not important to me i, I just wanted to hike 2000 miles this summer and um, currently i'm on track to do that nice. you know it's not going to be the full 2200 but 2,000 is a hell of a lot, in my opinion. Yeah, meals, not miles. <laughs> Quite right. Too. Exactly. Oh, my God, I've been eating so much. <laughs> I'm about to make some veggie shawarma with my buddy tonight. So tell us about New Hampshire. Because, you know, it is did, – firstly, did you have great views in New Hampshire? Because New Hampshire can be totally ruined if the weather's lousy. But did you, you've had nice sunny weather, yeah. haven't you? For the most part. Like, going over Bald Plate, there was a lot of rain, and that was a bad time. I fell a lot, but – for the most part, it was gorgeous. Oh, my God, I did. I thought it was going to rain, so I went over Franconia Ridge, Mount wow. Lincoln and Lafayette. Wow. Woke up at 3 a.m., and I got the most incredible sunrise in my entire life. These crazy winds whipping over the mountain and the sun peeking out and the, the clouds you know, gusting over the hills. It was absolutely incredible. It's one of the, it's one of the truly magical thousand. places, really truly magical places, I think, Franconia Ridge. I know it's one mm-hmm. – I, I, I remember going above the tree line and started giggling first time I went in 2014. It was like nothing I'd ever seen in my life before. And you know, it's all spreading out ahead of you just with peaks and then more peaks behind those peaks and peaks behind those peaks. It's just magnificent, isn't it? It was it was really something special. You get – you get great views in Colorado, but you don't get that whole Smoky Mountain view like no. you do in the East Coast. It was really an absolute treat. Challenging, but I still managed to average about 18 a day. Uh-huh. And and all the stuff people warned me about, there were all these fear-mongering nobos, ooh, watch out for Musilaki and Kinsmen. We did both of those in one day. Oh, my it God. It was great. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It was so much fun. <laughs> I did Musilaki. I did the climb up there in like half an hour. I thought it was a great workout. And a beautiful mountaintop. Wow! Wow! Good for you, man. Good for you. You, you've yeah. so 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 far. You let me fill in the gaps of where you are then and what you've done. You went from uh, Georgia. I, I've I've, I've, mm-hmm. I've got no notes in front of me again. I'm afraid, apart from the ones you sent me. You went from Georgia uh, all the way to where you missed the Smokies, but where else Harper's did you? Fair. To Harpers, right? And then you you flipped up and you went to Monson. And then headed through the 100-mile wilderness north and then came back to Monson and went south? No, no. So I actually had a friend just drop me at A-Ball Bridge and oh, we hiked right. south from there. Oh, right. So we've been going south right. from A-Ball ever since. Right. Did you – the 100-mile wilderness, I think that's fun myself. Did you enjoy it? I had the most fun. The last 200 miles, like in the 100-mile wilderness and 100 after that, I think are by far the most enjoyable backpacking I've ever done. I love the river crossings yes. and the beautiful mountains, and I am so excited. I'm going to go back and do it again with some friends at least one or two more times in my life. It was fantastic. Yeah. I love Maine. It's funny, actually. I, I didn't realize how great the 100-mile wilderness was until I did it second time because the first time I mm-hmm. split it up and kept going back to Monson for four – I literally slept four nights in the 100-mile wilderness. I slept <laughs> back in Monson, and that's the wrong – it's the worst thing to do because you don't get the feeling of being actually in a wilderness. And going mm-hmm. through it last time, it was so much better to have gone through it that full 100 miles. I really enjoyed it. So what's next? You're in Vermont now. Where, where are you heading next? Next is Rutland. I'll be in Rutland in like a day and a half. Right. Um, my friend and I just kind of hitched back to his car from this random spot in the road. He had a week off, so 
taking today off, tomorrow off, and then Thursday I'll be back on trail. Cool. And actually, oh, I'm so excited. So I was hiking out of the Welcome Hikers Hostel, and I ran into this lady, Wick, who I hiked with in Damascus. <laughs> so I'm starting to run into all my, my old Nobo buddies. I ran into Fuel Can, and I'll be running into my friends Cardi and Gonzo in Rutland. We're going to do a huge meal. Nice. And then I'm waiting for Beans and Newfound, my other two friends uh, that are in New York currently. And it's going to keep going south from there. And then actually my friend from the Colorado Trail, who also has a very large dog, will be flying out from Colorado and is going to join me for a week. Yeah. Well, look, I'm glad you got safely with your dog through the, the notch. It is tough and to, for a big dog. Geez, I, I, I was worried, a little bit worried for you, but I'm glad you got through it. And uh, send me a picture. Send me another picture, a latest picture. I'd love to see how you guys are looking that, uh, these days. And uh, and I'll put, that, I'll put that in the show notes, all right? So, but I'll, I'll catch up with you in a couple yeah. of weeks' time. Yeah, I'll let you know when we're, I don't know, Pennsylvania or New York or something. Yeah, great to talk to you. Okay, mate. Take it easy. Enjoy the rest couple, next couple yeah. of days. Bye. Goodbye. I think I have a point of what Dan's having, won't you? It feels to me that he's found a niche out on the trail with food and cooking, an important part of his life out there. And getting through the notch didn't seem a lot of fun for him, but thankfully the two of them made it and it's behind them now. Just before we get to the end of Chapter 4 of Then the Hell Came, I want to give a quick shout out to our donors over the past two weeks. Thanks go to monthly donors Natisha Webb, Todd Withrow, Suzanne Johnson, Jan Haley, John Crowler, Betty McEnany, Anne Pickin, Sean Debwiley, and Emmanuel Brother Ramos. We also received generous donations from Christine Thornton and John Park. Thanks to one and all. By the way, one of those donors I mentioned, Emmanuel Brother Ramos, also recently sent me something extra special. He had used a fedora handmade in Puerto Rico for his rim to rim hike of the Grand Canyon with his wife Karen, and he asked me if I'd accept a similar handmade hat for my upcoming Sierra's hike. Of course, I accepted. Though I did ask if we could delay the measuring because I had shaved my head at the time. Well, they didn't have a fedora, but they did have a borsalino, which apparently is more elegant. Check out my picture in the show notes. Am I looking elegant or what? I'm looking forward to wearing it in the Sierras next month. Thanks, guys. What a treat. Now, the second part of Chapter 4 of Then the Hell Came. It's only a short section, about 10 minutes, but our hero has reached Hot Springs and is staying at Elmer's. Happy memories for me indeed when I stayed there on both my hikes. I'll see you next week. Tuesday, 24th of May, 1983. Mile 267.6. Hot Springs. I awoke cold and clammy this morning and lay in my sleeping bag fascinated watching tiny wisps of cloud swirl in through the gaping holes in the wall above my head, drift leisurely across the ceiling and slip out of the open side. In my benumbed and dazed mental state, this simple entertainment was able to amuse and engross me for about an hour. Then I got up and made breakfast. It had rained sporadically throughout the night. I had left my largest pan out beneath a corner of the roof last night, hoping for the best, and had thus collected three cups of scummy water for breakfast. I cannot complain. At least I had water. Dave and I were still full of a weird, punchy elation this morning. I personally felt as though I had passed an initiation or survived a rite of passage. I could conquer the mountain weathers. We laughed and joked about everything, particularly the strange pathways on which our minds had journeyed the previous night. We had been given the heady gift of a brief glimpse of actual madness followed by a quick return to sanity in the morning, or at any rate as close to sanity as guys like Dave and me ever get. A sign next to the shelter read, Toilet, with an arrow pointing out a path leading off into the woods. This became the butt of numerous jokes, pardon the pun. We speculated that its destination was probably a naked toilet sitting out in the open forest. Later, Dave was required to pay a visit, and surprise! We had been virtually correct. It had no roof and just a three-foot-tall partition around three sides. The commode sat above a shallow pit of irregular shape, which extended slightly past the sides of the unit. It was a cold, damp, blustery morning. Dave was treated to an invigorating gale blowing in through the edges of the hole and funneling up through the bottom of the toilet. He has all the luck when it comes to these matters. 
In Fontana Village, when I'd picked up a bottle of baby powder to keep the jewels dry, David thought it an excellent idea. He bought one too. This morning, as I was starting down the path to take a picture of the toilet as a memento of the place, Dave was getting the powder out of his backpack, saying, Boy, this is going to feel good today. A few moments later, I was frozen in my tracks by the sound of his blood-curdling scream. I shouted, What's wrong? My effing hands are cold! Forewarned, I had warmed my hands beneath my armpits for a few moments later before I applied my baby powder. This had limited effect. I discovered a surefire method of snapping myself awake on a cold morning. It gave a whole new meaning to the expression, get a grip on yourself. It was mid-morning when we started out, and the sun was just starting to peek through the clouds and fog. As I was leaving, I paused to tear a page out of my journal notebook for a sign rechristening Walnut Mountain Shelter Heartbreak Hotel. The morning mists eventually gave way to a fairly pleasant day. I began the hike with five non-stop miles over Walnut Mountain, up Bluff Mountain and down the other side. Near Bluff's summit, the sky darkened, the wind kicked up and I began to hear thunder. That almost blew my good mood, but the sun quickly emerged from behind a passing wisp of cloud, the stray gust of wind died out and the thunder turned out to be the sonic boom of a military jet. Renewing my vow to Mother Nature, I continued onward. Near Gorinflo Gap, on the far side of Bluff Mountain, I found a sunny little meadow and decided to take my first break. Having filled my canteen at a stream crossing, I lay out for 20 minutes, chugging tang and devouring the last of my crackers and M&Ms. I was dehydrated all day. I usually catch up on my water intake at the shelters each night and tank up for the long day ahead in the mornings at breakfast, but the water situation at Walnut Mountain had precluded my usual routine. Dave was soon far ahead of me, and I drifted through the day alone. I was in no hurry. The next few miles were on an easy graded trail which skirted the slopes of a couple of mountains. There were a few good views, but I was running on empty all day. It was a relief to reach Deer Park Mountain Shelter, where I could sit down to rest and eat lunch. The structure was as dilapidated as Heartbreak Hotel had been, and the guidebook mentioned that its water supply was not very good. That was correct, but I had to wonder why the same warning was not given for the spring at Walnut Mountain. Had I known, I could have filled my canteens from a clear stream I crossed about a half mile before that shelter. At least Deer Park's water was drinkable. I was planning on a long lunch, but an entry in the shelter register mentioned that the inn at Hot Springs was often completely filled by early evening. It said that the inn was much nicer than the Jesuit Hotel, the only other accommodations in town, and the nightly rates were identical. I wanted to stay in the nicest place. I deserved it. Throwing my backpack on, I flew off down the trail, buckling my hip belt as I walked. I roared over the final three miles into town. In no time, I was beginning the last descent into Hot Springs. All along, I could see the place looming close through the trees. It was torture. My feet and legs were giving out again while I wanted very badly to run. I wound up with a curious, shambling trot down the mountain, a sort of cross between a Russian folk dancer and an old man with a load in his pants. By the time I hit the paved road into town, this had further degenerated into a painful crawl. Dave had rushed into town in order to make the post office before it closed. I met him on the main street of Hot Springs. He gave me directions to the inn. There, I met Elmer Hall, the owner, and he showed me upstairs to the room which Dave had already acquired for us. The place was a magnificent old two-storey mansion dating back to 1875, when Hot Springs was a thriving health spa resort town for the wealthy in an era when soaking in natural warm mineral baths was all the rage. Elmer was slowly rescuing the building from years of slow decay. Today, a room for the night cost us $8 each. As we walked upstairs, Elmer informed me that he does not serve dinners on Mondays and Tuesdays and that the only restaurant in Hot Springs closes at 6 o'clock. As it was already 5.30, I had to rush over there still dirty and smelly from the trail. I had three Cokes, two cheeseburgers, French fries and homemade chilli. Life is good. I returned to the inn for a long, hot shower while Dave brought our coloured clothes over to the laundromat. When he returned, I put my clean clothes on my clean body and took our whites over while he showered. I phoned home while I waited for the wash cycle to be completed. When the clothes were dry, I returned to the inn for the night. The old mansion sports a fine, two-tiered veranda running the length of the house. I spent a good part of the night relaxing on the upstairs portion near our room, 
gazing out over the town. After the early 1900s, warm mineral baths lost their popularity and hot springs was washed back into the quiet backwaters of time. The one remaining night spot seems to be a large barn of a roller skating rink which I walked past today. Hot Springs, North Carolina in 1983 is basically a one-street town a few blocks long surrounded by scattered farms and vast acreage of national forest. It straddles the French Broad River a few miles east of the Tennessee border near the cleft where that stream cuts through the bald mountains. I stayed up very late, sitting out on that veranda. The stillness of the warm southern night was occasionally broken by the long, lonely whistles of passing freight trains. There is a strange, special quality to time on the Appalachian Trail. Days pass with the slow, majestic crawl of a summer in childhood. Sometimes, like tonight, you find yourself in a place where time seems to have moved backwards to an era which ended before you were born.